Here's a, a trivia question for you. Uh, what do uh, William Paley, Pamela Harriman, John and Jacqueline Kennedy, Bill and Hillary Clinton, Queen Elizabeth II, and Diana, Princess of Wales, all have in common? The answer, of course, is they've all been the subject of a biography by Washington's own Sally Bedell Smith. And we're very excited to have her with us here this evening. Uh, now you can add to that list of names Prince Charles. Uh, in her new book, Sally returns to the British royal family and recounts the exceptional, or as the subtitle says, improbable life of the now 68-year-old heir to the British throne. Uh, many of us already have some pretty strong images of Charles. Um, uh, for instance, uh, of him as that stiff old fogey in a double-breasted suit who ruined Diana's life. Uh, you know, the sad archetypal royal uh, who has spent uh, his life in a long, frustrating search for meaning and love. Uh, but Sally provides a much more revealing portrait that shows Charles to be more informal, empathetic, amusing, and, well, just multi, more multi-layered uh, than is commonly perceived. Um, th this is not an authorized biography, uh, but the palace um, did assist uh, with interviews, uh, visits, and other research over the four years that Sally took to do the book, and her profile of Charles is generally uh, a rather sympathetic, if uh, a qu quite richly detailed one. Now, the queen turns 91 next week, and remains deeply involved uh, with her royal duties. Uh, Charles, who already is the oldest heir to the throne in 300 years, uh, could easily go years more before becoming king. Uh, but at least with Sally's book, uh, we now have a much better idea of who this complex man is and of all that he's already been through. Uh, and I might also add uh, that uh, Sally's book, which has just been out a week, is already number eight on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sally Bedell Smith. Thank you, Brad, for that wonderful introduction. I love coming to Politics and Prose, and I was so happy that I'm here tonight when I got this fantastic news just an hour ago that I'm on the list, which is sort of what you always um, dream about. Um, the ultimate, I suppose, affirmation, um, but the main affirmation is having my book read and enjoyed by people like you. Um, I think, did you uh, have a look at what I was gonna say tonight? But, uh, so, for much of his life, uh, Prince Charles has been profoundly misunderstood and stereotyped as an old fogey and blamed for the unhappiness of the late Princess Diana during, during their turbulent 11-year marriage. But he, was, he is equally a man who considered Joan Rivers to be a good friend and actually called her Miss Potty Mouth. <laughs> he was also cheered as Charlie My Darling by unemployed wor workers in a remote and very poor part of Scotland. I thought I knew Prince Charles pretty well after writing books about Diana and the Queen, but it wasn't until I examined him close up that I began to appreciate the forces that shaped him and the wide array of his interests and pursuits, not to mention his accomplishments. To just skim the surface, he created scores of charities to benefit underprivileged youth, poor farmers, and even endangered red squirrels. He wrote nine books and contributed to more than a dozen documentaries. He founded schools for architects, artists, teachers, and craftsmen. He built Poundbury, a model town where thousands of people of all income levels can live and work side by side and where the streets were designed for pedestrians rather than cars. He launched a successful line of food and other products called Dutchie Originals. He restored more than 65 buildings in the old quarter of Kabul, Afghanistan, where he also created a traditional arts institute. 
He, tr he transformed Dumfries House, which was a crumbling estate in Scotland, into a hub of training and employment and tourism. He takes pride in being a watercolor artist, and he sells lithographs of his work for $4,000 and higher to benefit his charities. To an unexpected degree, he has also relied on the United States for inspiration and guidance, including advisors and financial supporters. I also learned how different he is from his mother. As the longest reigning and oldest monarch in British history, the Queen is unique. Charles, however, is an original. When I asked his cousin, Lady Pamela Hicks, which parent he resembled, she hesitated and joked and said, I think he must be a changeling. <laughs> in other words, not obviously like either. While the Queen is a model of serenity, stability, and continuity, Charles is a bundle of quirks and restless energy and insecurities. Since she took the throne at age 25, the Queen has followed the strict routines of the monarch, carrying out her duties with discipline and efficiency and diligence. Charles has had a more ad hoc life, mapping out his role as he went along. The Queen has spent a lifetime concealing her thoughts and even her mundane likes and dislikes. Charles has left a, a trail of fervidly held and often controversial opinions and personal preferences. My challenge with the Queen was to part the curtain and to show what she's really like behind her inscrutable facade. For Charles, I needed to get my arms around his sprawling life and make sense of the events and individuals many of whom are surprisingly little known, that influenced him. I needed to understand the panorama of his interests and to show the threads of his thinking to explain how he changed over time and how in other ways he remained consistent. I wasn't prepared for such a long journey to understand this complicated and compelling man, even longer than for my book about the Queen, who was 22 years older. I spent four years traveling far and wide, interviewing some 300 people, watching him in action at home and overseas, visiting his residences, um, attending, uh, being fortunate enough to attend some private dinners at Buckingham Palace and St. James's Palace, and touring the projects that make him proud. The three words in my subtitle reflect what I found that he is a man of surprising passions and confounding paradoxes, and that despite his birth nearly 70 years ago as the heir to the British throne, his life has taken unforeseen twists and turns. Soft on the inside, on the outside, excuse me, Charles has what one of his cousins described to me as a moral hardness underneath. In his case, more than most, the experiences of his childhood were crucial in setting the course of his life, but not exactly in the way that his parents expected. He found comfort in the arms of his nanny, Mabel Anderson, and in the company of his grandmother, the Queen Mother, who indulged him and stimulated his appreciation of music and art. His duty-bound mother was preoccupied by her work, and Prince Philip, as head of the family, focused on toughening up his eldest son, who seemed too sensitive. Charles was the first heir to the throne to attend school outside the palace. When he was only eight years old, his father sent him to boarding school at Cheam in Hampshire, where Philip had been sent at the same age. Charles was acutely homesick, he hugged his teddy bear, and kept to himself. In his five years at Cheam, he made no lasting friendships. One of the most revealing and poignant moments of his childhood was told to me by his cousin, Lady Pamela Hicks, who recalled a luncheon when eight-year-old Charles was served wild strawberries. He was busy removing the stems when Pamela's mother, Lady Edwina Mountbatten, told him that he should pick up the strawberries <clears throat> and dip them in sugar. Moments later, Pamela saw the poor child trying to put all the stems back on the strawberries. <laughs> that moment said so much to me about his vulnerability, his eagerness to please, and his need for approval. 
Prince Philip also insisted that at age 13, Charles attend his alma mater, Gordonston, in an isolated part of northeastern Scotland. The school sought to build character through physical challenges such as runs at dawn followed by cold showers. Philip had flourished there with his athletic ability and his resilient temperament. He was determined to mold Charles in his own alpha man image, but his timid son described his five years there as nothing less than a prison sentence. He was bullied at night in the dormitories and on the rugby field, he was routinely punched. One of his classmates told me that Charles was stoic and never once hit back. Philip intensified the rigor of his son's education by sending him to, an, to the Australian outback for six months at a wilderness school. He survived endurance tests such as hiking 70 miles across country in blistering heat, and he showed his father that he was not, in fact, a weakling. He also developed confidence as he faced crowds at royal events for the first time and discovered that he could actually talk to strangers. Back at Gordonston, Charles bonded with two young teachers. His art master nurtured Charles's appreciation of high culture. The other teacher encouraged the prince to perform Shakespeare on stage and gave him the lead in Macbeth, leading to a lifelong love of Shakespeare and many charities and educational efforts to promote uh, the bard in school and in various productions. But was, at, but was as the case at Cheam, Charles made no friends among his peers. His parents surprisingly admitted that the school had driven Charles further inward and that he had been, in fact, a square peg in a round hole. Yet Gordonston gave him an inner steeliness and made him less conventional. Its emphasis on community service inspired Charles's later efforts to improve the lives of underprivileged teenagers. His three years at Cambridge University gave him his first taste of freedom and supposedly a normal existence. But his companions were all hand-picked, and his rooms at Trinity College had a kitchen and a private bathroom, which no other student had. He had failed at the classic schoolboy sports such as cricket and rugby and soccer, and so he took up polo to please his father, and he practiced relentlessly on a wooden horse at Windsor, at Windsor Castle. As time went on, the sport would be an essential release for his frustrations, especially during his marriage to Princess Diana. Without polo, Charles said he would have gone stark staring mad. When he met with reporters in June 1968, at the end of his first year at Cambridge, one of them called Charles a sweet virgin boy. He was not only inexperienced with girls, he was afraid of them. But the master of Trinity College, Rab Butler, introduced Charles to his first love, Lucia Santa Cruz, a beautiful Chilean woman who was five years older. The daughter of a diplomat, she was as brainy as she was gorgeous, with two university degrees, which was very unusual for girls at that, at that time. In the words of Rab Butler's wife, Lucia was someone on whom Charles could safely cut his teeth. One of the Queen's senior advisors even discreetly arranged safe havens for the couple. The romance didn't last, but Lucia changed Charles's life in the summer of 1972. He was coming to her London apartment for a drink, so she invited Camilla Shand, her friend and downstairs neighbor, to join them. Charles lost his heart to Camilla almost immediately. He was drawn to her lively personality, her down-to-earth irreverence, and her love of the countryside and sporting pursuits. Most of all, she gave him a sympathetic ear and the affection that he yearned for. You could see what a man could see, her, fr her friend Lady Annabel Goldsmith told me, an intensely warm, maternal, laughing creature with enormous sex appeal. Her family was upper class with one major claim to fame. Her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, was the mistress of Charles's great-great-grandfather, 
King Edward VII, who called her La Favorita. <laughs> Camilla admired her racy ancestors so much that she kept her portrait prominently displayed in her drawing room. She also learned the necessity of discretion from Alice, who burned nearly all of her correspondence with the king. When Charles and Camilla met, he was 23 and she was 25. She had left school at 16, which was not unusual for girls at that time. And while she was racing around London with the smart set and fox hunting near her family home in East Sussex, Charles was still a boy in boarding school. By 1972, she had been involved in an affair for six years with a dashing cavalry officer by the name of Andrew Parker Bowles. As her lifelong friend, Lord Patrick Beresford, told me, Camilla was absolutely potty about Andrew, who had a roving eye for other well-born women, including Charles's sister, Princess Anne. There is definitely a Venn diagram involved in this. <laughs> but starting that summer, Andrew was conveniently on overseas duty for six months, so Camilla was free to enjoy the attentions of the heir to the throne, who was thrilled to have found a woman he could love and cherish. While Charles was powerfully attracted to her, he was not ready to settle down. Also, as his cousin and godmother, Patricia Mountbatten, put it to me, Camilla had a history. And Charles was expected to marry a woman who at least appeared to be virginal. Still, when he left uh, England in January 1973 for his first posting in the Royal Navy, he expected Camilla to be there for him when he returned eight months later. Meanwhile, her father and Andrew's father, who were very good friends, conspired to publish an engagement announcement in the Times of London that March which forced Andrew to propose to Camilla. I mean, I don't think even the crown could make that up. <laughs> Charles felt blindsided, and he couldn't understand why his blissful relationship with Camilla had, ad had ended so abruptly. As an officer in the Navy, Charles fell under the sway of his great uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, known to everybody as Dickie. The younger brother of Philip's mother, Mountbatten was a heroic figure to Charles. As his parents were going about their royal duties, Dickie gave the insecure prince time, attention, encouragement, and affection. But he also gave Charles genuinely bad advice about love and marriage, <laughs> urging Charles to sow his wild oats and have as many affairs as possible before settling down with a sweet-charactered girl he could place on a pedestal. Rather than learning from mature relationships, Charles spent his his 20s in a series of brief flings. All the women he dated, many of them daughters of dukes and earls and other noblemen, fell short, including Diana's older sister, Sarah Spencer. The most promising prospect, conveniently, was Charles's cousin, Amanda Natchbull, Dickie Mountbatten's granddaughter. She was nine years younger, but she was self-possessed, smart, sensible, and strong enough to be one of the first girls to attend Gordonston. Dickie promoted the match, and Charles even proposed marriage. But Amanda politely turned him down because there was no chemistry, and she didn't want to settle for something less than a love match. Wherever Charles went, he drew crowds of adoring fans. The tabloids called him Action Man, and his exploits dominated the headlines. He played polo, he learned to ski, and took up windsurfing. He also began fox hunting, at least in part to be near Camilla Parker Bowles. They had crossed paths when Andrew's polo team competed against Charles's. When the Parker Bowleses had their first child, they asked Charles to be one of the seven godparents. Only days after the christening in February 1975, Charles joined Camilla on the field at the prestigious Beaufort Hunt. Now this was noteworthy because he had been terrified of jumping on horseback since childhood, but he overcame his fears and threw himself into the sport. And he and Camilla both rode with the Beaufort, shared the thrill of the chase, and she became his confidant. 
although Camilla and Andrew had a second child on New Year's Day in 1978. She had actually given up on her husband, who was compulsively unfaithful. His nickname was Andrew Poker Bowles. <laughs> Toward the end of 1978, she and Charles resumed their affair. By then, Charles was starting to develop projects on his own and to create a role that went far beyond ribbon cutting and unveiling plaques and statues. He had a private income of more than a half million dollars a year, which in today's dollars would be the equivalent of 3.5 million. His first major project was the Prince's Trust, which he set up in 1976. His idea was to transform the lives of disadvantaged youth by giving them small grants for self-help projects. One of those that he helped was Idris Elba, who would go on to be one of the stars of The Wire. His hope was that these young people could achieve something and become responsible adults. It would be his most celebrated charity, with an impressive track re record over four decades of helping more than 800,000 young people learn skills and find employment. Charles celebrated his 40th birthday with 1,500 grateful recipients and danced vigorously with three young women, one of whom said afterward, he told me I was a good mover. He dances well for an old man. <laughs> the public Charles was busy launching charities, but the private man was a spiritual seeker under the influence of a series of gurus. When Charles took up watercolor painting at 21, he said that it transported him into another dimension and refreshed his soul. In his mid-twenties, he befriended Lawrence Vanderpost, the well-known Afri South African writer. Vanderpost taught Charles that primitive people should be revered for their relationship to the spirit of the earth. The prince also recorded his dreams for Vanderpost's wife, Ingrid, to interpret. And over the next five years, he, he periodically met with her for therapy sessions. In August 1979, Dickie Mountbatten was assassinated by Irish Republican Army terrorists. Charles felt agony, disbelief, and what he described as wretched numbness. He had Camilla to console him, but he needed a wife to support and understand him. At age 31, he was feeling pressure from his family and the media to settle down at last, do his duty, and produce the next in line to the throne. He proposed to 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer after they had been together just a dozen times with few private moments. He figured he could learn to love Diana, who had charmed him with her beauty and her warmth. But their 12-year age gap was unbridgeable. They had no intellectual connections, few mutual friends, and no interests in common. Nor did Charles know that Diana had a history of emotional instability dating back to her parents' traumatic divorce when she was six years old. His hasty choice set off the most acrimonious and mortifying 16 years of his life. It was beyond imagining that what seemed like a fairy tale wedding would lead to divorce and barely a year later, Diana's death at age 36 in a car crash in Paris. He had tried to make the marriage work and had given up his affair with Camilla for five years until, as he admitted in a television documentary, his relationship with Diana had irretrievably broken down. Yet during those personally painful years, Charles came into his own as Prince of Wales. He sounded an early warning on the impact of man-made pollution on the environment, and he became an evangelist on the dangers of climate change. He challenged the medical establishment for failing to treat the whole patient. He criticized modern farming for its use of chemicals and genetically engineered crops. Most notably, he excoriated modern architecture for being elitist and failing to consider the wishes of ordinary people. His most famous speech in 1984 attacked the proposed new addition to the National Gallery in London as a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much-loved and elegant friend. The eventual winning design combined classicism and modernism in a building that fit perfectly with the National Gallery. 
it was Charles's first major public victory. With his enterprises and his charities, Charles was determined to convince everybody that he was a serious social observer and to make the world a better place, at least according to his lights. As thoughts occur to him, he jots them down where, while tramping around the countryside, keeping endless p bits of paper in every single jacket. At meals, he has a silver notepad by his side. In the evening, he furiously writes letters and memos, always with a fountain pen. He shuns computers and avoids what he calls emails. <laughs> Instead, he fills the pages of his crested stationery with his distinctively thick handwriting, which led people to call them his black spider letters. At Highgrove, his estate in Gloucestershire, he created an ambitious garden that was, by his, his uh, description, the outer expression of my inner self. Its distinctive features include a neo-Victorian stumpery, and little do visitors know that the golden hedges clipped into eccentric shapes were inspired by platonic and Archimedean solids that represent earth, water, fire, and the universe. And they also don't know that Charles often lies down on the floor in his living room when the windows are open to listen to what the visitors to the garden are saying about it. <laughs> Tucked away from prying eyes is Charles's sanctuary. The intimate design was based on his exact measurements, fingertip to fingertip, like Leonardo da Vinci, he has said. The bricks are made of local clay and straw. There's no electricity, and everything is handmade, including Byzantine icons um, designed by a hermit who uh, Charles met when he was on a pilgrimage to Mount Athos in Greece. Charles calls the sanctuary the place where nobody can get to me. To enter, he manipulates two of four doorknobs in a secret combination. Charles, as you can gather, is an unusual mixture of traditional and modern. He is a strong proponent of green energy, and Poundbury, his model town in Dorset, uses plant waste to produce renewable fuel in a cutting-edge facility. Yet on his organic farm... <clears throat> Charles encourages the use of heavy horses and scythes over mechanized tractors. He also learned the ancient art of hedge laying, and from October through March, he spends hours bending and cutting branches with axes and handsaws to construct his hedges. After the death of Diana, Charles rebuilt his life, taking comfort from a sign that he hung in his dressing room that said, Be patient and endure. His crucial achievement was to show that he was a loving and responsible parent to William and Harry. Prince Philip had ruled his eldest son with an iron grip until Charles left the Navy and began creating his own role. Charles gave his, his sons more latitude to have a relatively normal life, even shopping at supermarkets. Their grandmother was an important force as well. William called the Queen a strong female influence he could look up to. He and Harry grew close to their grandmother, much as Charles had relied on the Queen Mother for so many years. As one of William and Harry's senior advisors told me, they were two guys on a raft after the shipwreck in their family, and they made it to shore, which brought them together. Unlike Charles and his siblings who work on their own, William and Harry knew they could have a multiplier effect if they worked as a team. As they grew older, Charles sensibly permitted them to choose experienced advisors to guide them in crafting their roles. Two highly regarded military officers and a veteran diplomat, some of, you, some of whom you may know, um, David Manning, who had been a British ambassador to the United States. William's view reflects a broad public consensus than his, than his father's more controversial approach. As his senior advisor told me, William is like his grandmother. He gets on with his duty, dedicates himself to doing his job. He's not flashy. He's not an entrepreneur. He's not a ruffler. After William married Kate, she turned the team into a dynamic trio. She understands how to use her charisma and her style, but she keeps the spotlight very much on her husband. William and Kate combine informality and dignity 
and they understand the power that comes with mystery. As one of the Queen's cousins told me, she can see continuity in William and Kate and their two children, George and Charlotte, and that has changed her life. Charles is now more comfortable in his own skin, and the warmth of his relationship with his mother was evident in his 90th birthday tribute film that some of you may have seen when they reminisce together while watching old home movies together. The principal moderating force in Charles's life has been Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, since their marriage in 2005. Their love story, stretching over more than 40 years, has been framed by a deep and abiding bond, by Charles's loyalty and devotion and Camilla's understanding and support. Joan Rivers, who befriended Camilla in the years after Diana's death, saw her as someone who could be rowdy with him and silly with him and normal with him. She's rough around the edges in a good sort of way. Camilla also keeps him level, as was clear one Saturday afternoon in the spring of 1998 at his High Grove estate at a time when she was still very much in the shadows. Charles was supposed to take a helicopter to a charity golf match and receive a million pound check for the Prince's Trust. But he was enjoying his day off and he refused to go. Look, come on, Camilla said, who else can go for 45 minutes in a helicopter and be back in time for tea? And by the way, you're collecting a check for a million pounds. I wish I were earning that daily rate. <laughs> Charles couldn't help laughing and he did his duty. And that moment encapsulated, for me, the dynamic of their relationship. At age 57, Camilla adapted well to royal routines. Most important, she won over the queen, who appreciates her down-to-earth unfussiness and the fact that she loves her dogs and her horses. And like the queen, she has, con she has kept a consistent hairstyle. <laughs> Thanks to the hairdresser who travels with her and always has a supply of fake hair to make sure her tiaras are comfortable. Camilla will almost certainly be crowned queen when Charles takes the throne. Constitutional experts say that under English common law, she has every right to the title of queen and that to have anything less would be unacceptably inferior. Queen Elizabeth II now has three generations of heirs in direct succession, Charles, William, and George, but there is no mechanism to skip Charles and give the crown to William. Charles turns 70 next year, so his reign will be far shorter than that of his mother's record-breaking 65 years and counting. As king, he has the potential to inspire as a unifying force above and beyond politics, like his mother, but with a different style and tone from the queen. <clears throat> he can be expected to show his feelings more and to speak more naturally and probably more frequently than his mother by conducting himself with dignity and serious of seriousness of purpose, yet keeping a lid on his opinions, by respecting royal traditions, by showing a sense of, of duty, as well as his humanity and his charm, he could well win the affection and admiration he has long sought. Thank, thank you. So, questions to the microphones, I guess. Yeah. Yes, uh, good evening. Thank you uh, for your talk. I just uh, had a question about uh, a lot of uh, the other European uh, royal families. Uh, they have, uh, even the Pope, they've got, it. abdication and resignation has become sort of commonplace. Yes. Uh, do you ever see uh, Prince Charles, once he becomes king, if he gets to a point of, of old age where he would take that step? Uh, I doubt it very much. I mean, it starts with the queen. There was a one, when, when Pope Benedict stepped down a couple of years ago, there was a wonderful thing that spread around the Internet, and it had a picture of Pope Benedict on the top and the queen on the bottom, and it just said, wuss. <laughs> and, but the queen, um, I mean, there's a real fear of abdication in the royal family going back to the abdication of Edward VIII. 
um, which was which which mainly because it it creates a sense of instability if you can supplant one monarch with another for one particular reason there's no re there you know you could conceivably come up with another reason and that just in and of itself um puts the monarchy in jeopardy because it makes it sort of optional and i know that you know that they've been able to do that in other countries but in the british royal in the british royal family that tradition of the queen is dead long live the king is just so deeply implanted also and I learned this mainly when I was doing the book about the Queen and talked to some uh, Anglican um, priests. They said, the thing you have to remember about the coronation is not so much putting on the crown. It's that she was, and those of you who have watched the series, The Crown, saw this happen. Uh, she was anointed with holy oil, and she made a, a solemn, sacred oath to serve until her death. And she has, over the years, reiterated that pledge at various times. Um, she's told uh, her wonderful cousin who died not long ago, uh, Margaret Rhodes, she said, um, you know, if I ever get Alzheimer's or have a stroke or something like that, I would step aside. And there is a mechanism for that, and it's called the Regency Act. And there are very specific steps that, me, that would be taken. And, and if that were to happen, um, Charles would become the Prince Regent and on her death would become king. So they sort of have it all set up, and it's, you know, unless the same thing happened to Charles, um, he's been pretty imbued with all those principles that he wouldn't just step aside for William. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, he stole my question, actually, but I've got sort of a related question. Um, <clears throat> I think you can make a very good case that the reign of Elizabeth II has brought about a tremendous demise in the British Empire. And the Brexit uh, situation is just the latest chapter. Now, I had a personal hope and expectation that the Iron Lady would infuse a bolt of lightning into the country, <laughs> but I don't see that. And so I guess my question is, England was formerly the nation upon, or the kingdom upon which the sun never set. Right. And now it's in total eclipse, I think. Well, I I disagree that it's okay. I think it's a, a pretty robust country and we'll see how they deal with Brexit but um and there's there's been a lot of speculation about what the queen thought of Brexit and what Prince Charles thought of Brexit, Brexit and they naturally never said anything although uh, Michael Gove, who was one of those who tried to become prime minister after David Cameron <laughs> stepped down uh said that the queen had had sort of expressed her um approval of brexit at a at a uh, at a at a dinner and at a dinner last april and i i mean i can sort of understand why she would have be, been inclined toward brexit because she believes so um strongly in british sovereignty and i think a lot of the people who voted for brexit were doing it on that basis because they felt that the powers of westminster were being usurped by the European Parliament and the bureaucrats in Strasbourg, and uh, even Prince Charles wrote some letters objecting to your EU rules that ha that were making his his favorite one of his favorite um, causes, homeopathic medicine, more difficult. Um, but I, you know, I, I I go to England a lot, or and I mean, I think the bigger threat right now is is the possibility of breaking up. Uh, the United Kingdom, and if there's a second referendum in Scotland, which I think would be self-defeating for the Scots, because if they think that they, they, I mean, they've been given a lot of latitude by um, Parliament in London, and I don't think the European Parliament's going to be any more partial to them. They get an enormous amount of money from uh, from England. Thank you. But it's, uh, you know, to watch this space, you know. <laughs> Yes. Hi, I've Hi. long been a, a, an admirer and defender of Prince Charles. I like the same things he likes, opera. So when, how long into their marriage did it become to express itself that uh, Diana was a bit troubled? And how did this express itself? Well, it was, it was even before they walked down the aisle in St. Oh, Paul's. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. my stars. She, she was, she was, um, she, she had a lot of, 
symptoms of serious emotional and mental distress. And uh, by her own admission, she, um, in the book that came out in 1992 that she um, heavily participated in, um, in the interview she gave in 1995, she admitted that she had not only had many bulimic attacks, but suicidal thoughts, severe depression. She had taken shards of glass and cut herself. Um, great mood swings, feeling, you know, absence of self-worth. This is something that, I mean, she had suffered from some of these symptoms earlier, but they were magnified by the celebrity and the um, scrutiny that she was under. So Charles knew before the wedding that she, that, uh, that she was troubled, but he kept thinking that it was pre-wedding jitters and then it was post-wedding jitters and then it was pre-partum depression, then it was postpartum depression. And there's an expression about the royal family that they, there's something that ostriching, you know, when they're dealing, when they have something that they can sort of see in front of them, they just kind of hide their heads and don't acknowledge it. And, and, the, and the, um, the whole attitude toward m mental health was very intolerant then. And um, so she tended to be dismissed. It was a, so it was evident to him, he couldn't, Sadly, he couldn't talk to his parents about it, which I think was such a tragedy. I was I was recalling today that um, in 1983, okay, just two years after their marriage, um, Charles was trying to do his best to 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 learn to like things that Diana liked, uh, rock music, and so um, so they had Princess Trust had a series of concerts, and um, there was one in 1982, extremely successful. And then another one in 1983. They they got to be good good friends with with um, Phil Collins and his wife Jill. And Charles went backstage and sat on Phil Collins's uh, stool and he banged on his drums and he let Jill kiss him on the cheek and call him Charles and defy all sorts of protocol. But so he kind of liked being around these rock musicians. And for the second concert. Um, they planned to have Duran Duran and Dire Straits. And Diana said ah. to the producer, wow, what the, you know, why did you choose those two? And they said, well, we thought they were your, your, your favorite uh, artists. And, um, and she said, no, no, no. My favorites are Supertramp. And why aren't they scheduled? And the producer said, well, they've sort of reached the end of the road. And she looked at him and she said, oh, you mean just like a marriage? Um, so, you know, that was 1983. Um, and it was, you know, it was just, it was tr a tragedy. I don't think uh, either one was to blame. Uh, it was a mismatch from the start. They were sort of pushed into it by circumstances. And um, I think his intentions were good. He did give up Camilla. Um, but obviously he still saw her, you know, she, they were hunting together and he was her son's godfather. And, but, um, but, um, Diana became consumed with jealousy of her and even of their friends. I mean, she banished, she even banished his Labrador retriever, Harvey, because he represented Charles's old life. So oh it was just fraught with problems, um. Um, from day one, I'm sad to say, but that was that was the truth. Do you think that he and the boys ever talked about this after Diana's death? You know what? Before? Well, you know what was is fascinating to me is that um, that William and Kate and Harry have this big initiative going on right now, uh, promoting um, called Heads Together, and they've gotten a lot of mental health charities together. They're sponsoring the London Marathon on the 23rd of April. And they're encouraging people to speak more openly about mental illness, to seek treatment, trying to destigmatize it. They haven't said anything specifically. This is related to my to our mother, but Char but Harry actually said um, not too long ago that it that it took him 28 years to talk about his mother's death. So, um, you know, they are really just coming to terms with it, and they are sort of remarkably stable, um, you know, for all that they witnessed as children. Yep. For someone who uh, you have pointed out has been so good uh, in public service, yes. with so much passion, why have the British public 
and the press not given him his due. In fact, they have gone out of their way to even vilify him. Well, <laughs> there's a saying, he's a prophet without honor in his own land. And uh, I think that the stereotype of him was embedded very early on, and the, and the whole Diana specter just hasn't gone away completely. I think they've been better. They've been, they've been more positive um, in the years since Diana's death, and they've, and they've really warmed to Camilla, too. But um, at one point a couple years ago, William said, I just wish people would give my father a break. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Charles has longevity on both sides, actually. I mean, yeah, Philip and Jen, Jen is key. Anyway, oh, really? I'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I must remember that. <laughs> but Philip is still breathing, warm. I mean, he's oh, Philip. The there was a picture right. of him a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was out with his four-in-hand carriages driving through uh, Windsor. <laughs> Um, and the Queen is still riding, you know, she's still riding her, her fell ponies through Windsor Great right. Park. So um, even though he might not have a tremendously long reign, I mean, yeah. you know, he could have 20, 25 years. So with respect to William, who seems to be the, I mean, you look up in the dictionary of the perfect royal, his picture and his whole family's there. Yeah. How, what have you heard about Charles or... How is he sort of guiding William to live the next 20 or 30 potential years as a monarch in waiting as well? Well, uh, William is getting very good advice. I think, um, I mean, Charles has obviously guided him in right. his own way. But what's fascinating to me is that, that the queen, in a way, has had a deeper imprint. I mean, partly because he was at Eton, he could see her a lot. She filled a void when he lost his mother. And, um, you know, in many ways, she's closer to William than she ever was to Charles. Um, and he's had some really good guidance. And the advisors that I spoke to say that he is being prepared to take the throne in middle age to late middle age right. um, and that he's playing a long game. He's not, he doesn't want to be a hostage to fortune. He is not making a lot of controversial statements. Um, he's, his, you know, his causes are, you know, who can argue with promoting a greater tolerance and uh, in terms of mental health, who can argue with trying to save um, elephants and, and, you know, from being and slaughtered being for their ivory, pilot too, and he and he and he has had a, a real legitimate career right. that has also kept him grounded. I mean, his his mates, you know, in the yes. East East Anglia Air Ambulance Corps are just ordinary guys, and uh, Harry's the same way. You know, he loved being with his squatties, and he was out in. Um, to Helmand, Pro Helmand Province, and he, he saw some serious action. I mean, I talked to a photographer who was embedded with him and recounted a time when they went out on patrol and Harry was in an armored personnel carrier and the, and the vehicle in front saw a bo a, a, an embedded bomb in, in, and they had to wait in a very exposed position um, until somebody could, you know, the bomb squad could come and defuse it. Um, and, and there were many instances like that that we didn't, we weren't really aware of, but um, he really, you know, performed heroic service. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you see the British people wanting to prolong the monarchy per secula seculorum? I I think so. I mean, look, the 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 Queen. Um, has a popularity rating of about 80 percent, which um, certainly doesn't ever happen in this country. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I mean, a lot of people say, boy, I wish we had somebody like the Queen that could set a standard for uh, serv public service and could honor, you know, I mean, she hands out uh, thousands and thousands of honors every year to people who, you know, for their service to their community and, uh, and and just um, you know is a binding force um, in times of trouble and um, 
times of celebration. She represents the monarch. She and the monarchy represents centuries of tradition and, you know, a lot of pretty great values, I think. And uh, as I said, I love the phrase, she's a light above politics. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that people sort of now realize that's more important than ever. Um, you know, the years of the 80s and 90s, everybody was misbehaving, and the, the people who wanted to overthrow the monarchy had some momentum at the time. But, um, but I, think, I think people really genuinely believe that's a, that it's a positive force. I mean, do they really want to have President Gordon Brown or <laughs> President David Cameron or... You know, I mean, it just doesn't have the same resonance. So even under Charles, they would. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's going to be a it's going to be a very very uh, emotional time when the Queen dies, um, more than perhaps we saw with Diana, more than the Queen Mother. Um, most of the people in this room have known nothing other than the Queen. I mean, there are a few people who may remember George the Sixth, but she has been in our public imagination for uh, 65 plus years. Yeah. Um, given your study and the history of Charles, if Charles ever asked you how could he become Charles the Great in the British history, what would be your advice to him? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Charles the Great. Well, actually, one of, his, uh, one, of, one of his advisors likened him to Frederick the Great uh, in the 13th century because Charles is this sort of, um, you know, Renaissance man and uh, believes in interfaith dialogue. And, I mean, I think it's it, the, 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 gra the idea, nobody really, I mean, some people have called Elizabeth Elizabeth the Great, but because it's not a power, position of power, you know, it's probably not um, not something that he that would be um, attached to him. Um, I think if you know if he if he conducts himself in his own style in the way the Queen has, using influence and convening power, um, that you know I think that can be recognized as as carrying out his duties in an admirable way. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, you've spoken about the close relationship with the Queen Mother and Prince yeah. Charles. Uh, a two-part question. Um, did she, the Queen Mother, have that same close relationship with, like, the Princess Royale and the other grandchildren? And the second part, how do you feel that the Queen Mother influenced his view of the monarchy or his role as future monarch? Well, I think um, he, he, she was definitely his favorite, <laughs> and she sort of made no. I mean, she obviously loved her other other grandchildren, but um, when she had her hundredth birthday celebration, which was really quite a spectacle, in in London, the person she wanted in the carriage with him, with her was Prince Charles. And if you, I've read a lot of the letters back and forth, and they they sh they just had this wonderful spirit between them and a great sense of humor and uh and and i so i think that, i mean i don't think she was very much involved in sort of schooling him mm -hmm. in how to be a monarch it was more the support she gave him and the and the just sort of general air of merriment that mm -hmm. uh that they had when they were together and um and and she had a place up in Scotland, Burke Hall, which is now his, and he has basically kept it the same. And right, Camilla complained to somebody, said, do we have to have all these tartan curtains with holes in them? <laughs> you know, really? But, uh, but, he's, but he reveres his, his grandmother's memory there and also in a place in northernmost Scotland called the Castle of May, where you walk in and there's her blue raincoat sitting on a peg. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he, he just, he loved her so much and she was just magical and um, gave him an awful lot of affection and support. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, a twofer. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, last question for me. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any plan to write a comparative perspective between the Thai monarchy and the British monarchy? And uh, if you have a any... Thai. Uh, yeah, Thai. Well, that's right. He was the longest, yes. wasn't he? Uh, yeah. and, 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 if you, uh, and if you were to compare uh, between the Thai and the British monarchy, 
um, how would you compare between I, the two? I, you know, I, 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 I confess ignorance on the on the Thai, and, and I obviously don't speak Thai, um, but um, so I, I, I wouldn't know how to go about that. Although it would involve some nice trips to Thailand, I suppose. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for being so attentive. <laughs>